This afternoon's session is about five speakers here giving us their opinion. They're all internationally around, they've all got very high profile reputations in this area, uh, and they've all got something interesting to say. So what would make this a good session? Um, a good session, I guess, for you guys, for the audience, is one where these guys present some challenging and thought-provoking issues for you to consider. Um, perhaps challenge your thinking, perhaps be a bit controversial in some respects. Um, a good session for these guys is that you're engaged and interested in listening um, and attentive to that. And a good session for me will be that we run to time, we stick to order, and it runs smoothly. But the second half of this session after our guests deliver their speech really depends on you because we're trying to engage you in the discussion and the debate. So in many respects, my role for those of you from the UK is a bit like in between David Dimble and, and uh, Jeremy Kyle, for example. So I'm going to have to try and keep a bit of order, but also um, keep a bit of constructive discipline to the event. So thank you for that. So let's introduce our guests here who are going to speak to you. Um, first of all, we have Dave Sweener, who many of you know very, very well. Um, Dave has been involved in uh, the uh, tobacco uh, industry at issue for many, many years, and he's going to share uh, a number of uh, thoughts, uh, issues, um, observations that perhaps stimulate some of the things that are important to you guys. And the other thing that's important to consider in that context is we are all from very different backgrounds. Some of us are manufacturers, some of us are consumers, some of us are regulators, some of us are public health professionals, and some of us are just interested people uh, in this type of subject. If I think about my own history in that, I started smoking at the age of 14, uh, and I stopped at the age of 48. Um, and I used e-cigarettes for the first three months after stopping, basically to get over cravings. So I understand the issues associated with being a smoker, um, and I understand the benefits that I felt personally of using e-cigarettes for a short period of time. Uh, but I know that e-cigarettes and other products may be a lifestyle choice for other people. Um, may help them to stop smoking or the motivation might just be a lifestyle choice. So uh, there's lots of thematic issues that are for us there. Next is Cynthia Cabrera. Um, and Cynthia um, you know, is a, runs a, a trade organisation for small e-cigarette companies in the US. And I'm sure she's going to give us an interesting perspective from there. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> because my notes are... She can update them. It's fine. One thing I should say, that everyone's biog is in the programme, so if you want to know what people do, you can get it from there. <laughs> Moving along the couch, we've got David uh, O'Reilly, who is uh, a director with uh, British American Tobacco. Um, here we have Alex, who many people know already and uh, contrib contributed uh, uh, last night. And lastly, Julie Vosner. Uh, and each of these people will give their own opinion. All I'm going to ask you to do is just give us a wee bit of order. David's going to kick us off with some thoughts for five or ten minutes, and then each person will, will follow on from there. Okay? First of all, it would be helpful if you gave these guys a round of applause just to help get them going. It's always good to be congratulated before we speak, um, j just in case no one feels like doing it afterwards. Uh, so as I said, I, I've spent over a third of a century uh, doing tobacco control work, uh, and a lot of that monitoring, uh, trying to understand the, the tobacco industry. So I, I was going to start off by giving some of my thoughts on uh, what's the role of the tobacco industry interacting with public health as we start looking at, at issues of harm reduction, uh, and then they'll probably tell you why I'm wrong. Uh, to begin with, I, I think we can't uh, assume that we're going to have anything other than the industry being involved. They really don't have any choice. So, you know, imagine what would happen when you've got people like me as a lawyer who's done things like help sue cigarette companies in the past. If you were a cigarette company and you develop products that were massively less hazardous than your current products, you knew about these products, you knew you could develop them, you knew you could sell them, and you knew consumers would use them. And then you decided not to market them non-option. Legally, ethically, they've got to move ahead. But also in terms of competition, because if they don't do it, somebody else will. And one of the things I learned early on in talking to, uh, uh, to people inside the, uh, the large tobacco companies, is most of them were really familiar with things like Clayton Christensen's S-curves, the way you can be a really established company, but somebody comes out of nowhere. And at first, you don't even notice them. 
And by the time you notice them, they've just grabbed your market. So they've turned you into a Kodak. They've turned you into Nokia. And they were very familiar with that, that they were dealing with an industry that was ripe for disruption. And how do you see off something like that? So the idea of just ignoring it really isn't an option unless you want to go the way of companies like Kodak. But given that they need to be involved, they have to be involved, they, 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 they've got to do this, what are the, the sorts of constraints that we face? And I think some of them, uh, when we look at the environment that this is operating in, can be put down to things like ideology and ignorance. Uh, and that's from, from my side, the, uh, the anti-smoking side, uh, largely. Uh, you've got people who have an abstinence-only view. that We don't want people to use any of this stuff, darn it. Uh, we're going to oppose anything. Uh, and if we can do things like ban the safest products, that's just as well as banning anything else because it's all evil. So ban snus if we can, ban electronic cigarettes if we can, uh, restrict pharmaceutical products if we possibly can. Uh, there's no room for negotiation when somebody has that sort of position. It is it's an absolutist position. But there's also the problems of, of ignorance of those who simply don't understand the industry. Uh, and I'd highly recommend uh, Clive Bates's blog, uh, latest entry, I, I think it was this week, talking about seeing this change from the standpoint of a tobacco company executive, because I think it gives really great insights and in why a whole lot of the things that anti-tobacco people say they ought to do are things that they can't do, things that aren't going to happen. We have to be realistic. We have to be pragmatic. We have to actually understand how, the, how things work. Uh, that moves into uh, issues of how do these things typically change? Because this is not all that unusual a situation. You know, we've had a whole range of products that, and services that have been incredibly hazardous, and they've changed. You know, people tend not to die from eating uh, uh, food because of botulism. Uh, we, we're not getting cholera by the, the water in our taps. We don't have one out of five industrial workers being injured or killed on the job every day. We don't have one major fatal train accident every month in a country like the United States. We don't have people dying by taking things that they thought were medicine that turned out to be poisons. We had all of those things. You know, that, that, that's what happened. Uh, things changed. Well, how did they change? It's a combination of a developing market where people see an advantage, that they can grab market share, they can, they can make more money by moving into something else, the way some food magnates realize they can make more money manufacturing food in sanitary conditions than in unsanitary conditions, because they'd have a relative advantage in the marketplace. But also, regulation. Regulation would come in to say, we're going to start setting standards. And that's why, you know, when we talk about how we wouldn't trust anybody from a tobacco company, well, those same companies used to own lots of other things. And while we'd say we don't trust tobacco companies, we did trust life insurance companies owned by tobacco companies, banks owned by tobacco companies, food manufacturers owned by, owned by tobacco companies. So people are eating their shredded wheat with, you know, what any, any, any concern, but it was, it was owned by a tobacco company. Well, because it was regulated and there was brand equity. I mean, if you started killing people who were eating your shredded wheat, you don't sell much shredded wheat anymore. So there were reasons that certain industries managed to transform. And we're just in this odd situation where the product that's our leading cause of preventable death now, and one where we could virtually eliminate the problem simply by changing the delivery system, you know, something really simple, is, is one of the last areas to tackle in terms of consumer safety. You know, you look at how rapidly we've, we've reduced automobile accidents by moving into harm reduction on uh, automobile design. Uh, we, we're really late getting to this one, but the map's already there. You know, one of the advantages of being late is that we can see what's happened with all these other issues. We can learn from that. Uh, but in trying to get to that regulatory environment, to try to get to an environment where the, the safety of the product is really important, and that consumers are adequately informed, what sort of regulation are we going to get? Because the regulation is going to be informed by politics. Um, and that's going to be shaped by the various players. So those who say, I do not want to get involved because I don't want to see anything happen in this area because I just think it all should be banned, are essentially abandoning the playing field and somebody else is going to set the rules. Public health can't do that. And then I'd say, and the tobacco companies can't afford not to be there. There's just too much at stake for them. So I think public health has to find a way to, to deal with this uh, and recognize that you know, the companies aren't there to promote health. 
you know, regulation can be, the different companies are going to have different vested interests and they're probably going to have different vested interests in different markets, depending on what sort of market share they have. We have to be able to pay attention to that sort of thing uh, and, and to know that we're trying to shape this in a way that's going to achieve public health. We need to understand each individual company, get past this idea that they're all a single amorphous blob. I mean, they all have very different interests. Different people within the different companies have different interests just like we saw with snake oil companies that morphed into modern pharmaceutical companies. Different, different interests, some people are gonna win, some are gonna lose, some companies are gonna win, some are gonna lose. How do we play that sort of thing to an advantage? But we need to do it. We don't really have any choice. Uh, we have to watch out for regulations that give a disproportionate advantage to continuing to sell cigarettes. And that's what happens when we're too risk averse, when we're saying, let's try to prevent these new products from doing anything that might be bad we guarantee that we're going to cause a problem. So th this whole idea of, uh, of un the fear of unintended consequences, and, and, you know, and one of the, the biggest unintended consequences is a direct result of our fear of unintended consequences, which is that we end up with more people smoking cigarettes. How do we avoid that sort of problem from happening? Uh, I think that uh, we're looking at ways that we can change a market, but we need to be aware with any particular company, are they trying to, to change a market in which public health comes to the fore and they have to compete within that market, or are they trying to change the market in a way that gives them a relative advantage within that marketplace? Very, very different sorts of, of outcomes. And again, we need to, you know, everyone involved to understand the different vested interests and how do we end up shaping this so that it's to the benefit of the public rather than the benefit of particular shareholders of a particular company. But it is going to happen. It, it, it's uh, one of these situations where we might be able to delay it through in, you know, incompetence, delay, intransigence, uh, ideology, ignorance. But when you've got between 700 and 800 billion US dollars equivalent per year being spent buying cigarettes, and most of those people are saying, I just assume not be doing this. And we know you can have something else because we're seeing it happen. It has happened in Sweden. It's happening big time now in Japan with the heat not burn. We're seeing the figures now from the UK about uh, in, in other countries on uh, electronic cigarettes. We're seeing the technology and what an incentive for somebody to get part of that 750 billion or so dollar market with huge potential for profit margin because we can adjust the regulations, we can adjust the taxes to ensure that the less hazardous products are the ones that consumers are more likely to get. So there's you know, three quarters of a trillion dollar market just open. You know, somebody's gonna get it, Who, who's gonna do that? And the larger companies are typically at a disadvantage, in my view, when, when you get technology and disruptive technology, because they have a lot to lose. When your market cap is already over $100 billion, like BAT, and much more than that for PMI, what if you get something wrong? And that's the reason why when we look at many of the companies that have now come to the fore in other areas of technology, they're companies that did not exist before that disruption happened. There's something that was launched, you know, a Facebook, a Google, an Amazon, uh, a Microsoft, a Starbucks. I mean, it's just on and on of companies that could come in because they could really take a risk. They could bet the company. And so we're in a very, very interesting situation here to say, who's gonna get it? And the answer from public health standpoint is, we don't care as long as we get what we want, as long as we end up fundamentally changing the trajectory of a, a billion deaths in the next hundred years as it relates to cigarette smoking. We can change that very rapidly. We can change it by engaging. And the, the potential is just enormous. That's my background. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Cynthia Cabrera, who isn't, uh, she doesn't lead a trade organization in America, but she's going to tell us what she does do. Cynthia. I'm a consultant to the vapor industry. I did used to run a trade association. I also could talk about this subject for hours. However, I promised I would stick to my notes, and so I shall. So, in a utopian world where there was no bias, there were no agenda-driven ideals, nothing like that, my comments would be very different. In this utopian world, if industry could lead the way, and understanding that the industry is led by consumer choices and preferences, well, public health's, public health's role 
would be to enforce proportionate and appropriate regulation, okay? Regulations based on product risk. I come from the vapor side of things, um, and while my role in the vapor industry has shifted since I started in 2011, uh, I am going to keep my comments on the vapor industry and not on the combusted tobacco, combusted cigarette tobacco industry. The format I took for this is that I'm going to highlight the challenges and opportunities between public health and the vapor industry. But I have to tell you that when I started working on this, I realized that there were a lot more challenges than opportunities. So, in the US, the ability for a company to morph and shift with the times and become harm reduction advocates is limited by regulation and by legislation. Underlying that is the inability to have, for the stakeholders to have effective dialogue. The vapor industry is incorrectly and consistently confused with big tobacco, with the old guard big tobacco boogeyman. As a matter of fact, I heard somebody today present and they said, um, traditional cigarettes. They were trying to make a distinction between vapor products and cigarettes, uh, combusted cigarettes, and they said traditional cigarettes. And it reminded me that that sets the stage for just making vapor products an extension of combusted cigarettes. It doesn't set them apart, it just ties them all together. Um, all segments of the vapor industry have effectively been, well, almost all segments, the business segments, have been effectively muzzled from discussing truthfully the benefits of vapor products and alternative products. The vapor industry was woefully unprepared to deal with entrenched public health organizations and their dogma. Funny story, in 2012, when I first met David Tweener, we were sitting outside having a cocktail, and I had only been in the industry for a year at the time. And I said to him that what I was going to do was I was going to have a meeting with Stanton Glantz, and I was going to explain to him how different the products were, and then like everything would be cool. Like he just didn't, you know, he just needed to understand that they're different, right? And David's response was, don't bother. So, <laughs> um, the vapor industry was also unaware of how big the job of distinguishing themselves from the combusted cigarette industry would be. Incredibly difficult. Um, for a long time also, the vapor industry did not land on the harm reduction message, despite the fact that that is what drove them there in the first place. Bad actors in the space do tarnish the industry, but companies are not negotiating individually. They speak for each other regardless of whether they think so or not. And there are missed opportunities. This is still in the challenges. We have missed opportunities. Engaging vape stores to be, you know, switching centers or mini cessation clinics. I mean, the ship sailed, but they could have been part of the solution as opposed to be branded, as opposed to being branded as a pro uh, problem. Public health and tobacco harm reduction advocates refuse to believe that someone could start a business to offer others benefits similar to what they received. The industry is judged for making a profit while helping others, but somehow pharma gets a pass. Um, a very well-respected tobacco harm reduction uh, professor once told me that he didn't believe the vape industry cared about harm reduction because he didn't ever see any marketing for cessation. For anybody here who doesn't understand how absurd that is, <laughs> see me later, preferably at the bar, because it's <laughs> going to be a long night. So, but that story highlights the fact that public health advocates who do support harm reduction, in quotes, don't always understand what's involved in the regulatory process or how the regulatory process impacts consumers and businesses. Candy and dessert flavors are easy targets for opponents. I, by opponents, I mean public health, because it successfully moves the conversation away from harm reduction um, to something else. Public health, even those that are supportive of lower risk alternatives, are hesitant to endorse vapor products, full stop. They're skittish around being, they're skittish about being around the industry, um, being attached to the industry. I'm not sure it's, if it's because they're gonna be branded or there's gonna be some reprisal or something like that. But it's not too late, right? Engagement is still possible. And I don't mean 
the Game of Thrones type of engagement where you bludgeon each other to death, right? Because we're already doing that. So we have the opportunity for a different kind of engagement. We could, for starters, agree on a basic set of principles. Adults are the market. Harm reduction is the priority, not abstinence. The vapor industry is not the old tobacco industry. Um, we have to trust that harm reduction is a mutual goal. The same person that I referenced earlier, that tobacco harm reduction person, also told me that he would never trust the vapor industry or trust that the vapor industry had a genuine interest in harm reduction because he didn't believe that they would just put themselves out of business by promoting less harmful products. What that relayed to me was his belief that it's an abstinence only program as opposed to allowing consumers to consistently buy products that are less harmful for however long they want to. Um, dual use, I'm sorry, dual use is an ideological problem, not a practical one. Uh, vapor products are good enough. Like, we're good. The industry has really become quite sophisticated. The products are very good. It's good enough. Let's, let's go from here. Let's start the dialogue here. Let's, let's go from here. Thanks to the difference between vapor products and combusted cigarettes, we could actually look in this utopian world. We could look at regulating the products based on the individual impact as opposed to the impact at the population level. Smokers and vapors could be included in the dialogue. We should establish a hierarchy of questions. Does every potential scenario have to be discussed? Does it have to be explored? Can we agree that harm reduction questions are more important than the questions meant to create doubt about a product? We should agree on basic definitions, or we could. When has a vapor quit smoking? What is addiction? What is dependence? Uh, what constitutes harm reduction? Smoking, by the way, is a behavior, not a disease. This comes from the consumer people. We need to expand our tent beyond the people who support us but are conditional in that support. Uh, we need to engage consumers who actually know how to use the product so that they can help craft or give input into studies so that the studies are actually useful and provide actual data, um, useful data. We need to have more dialogue, less interest in saving face. Public health advocates could start endorsing harm-reducing products, full stop. Just endorse them. Forget all the caveats that go with them. Uh, could bring in the consumers. There is a vape army out there of business owners and consumers that could be deployed in a variety of ways if only we could get to that point. So, if we could consider these things, Maybe the next time we have this conversation or I have comments on this conversation, it'll be a different scenario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. A strong message of engagement and collaboration there, I think. Um, our third speaker is David O'Reilly, who is Director of R&D uh, with BAT. David. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I must start with just saying that uh, I have no mandate to speak on behalf of the industry, but given that we do talk, I'll try and represent uh, some of the views of my colleagues, but if, if they disagree with me, then please, please shout. I'm going to echo a little bit. I didn't know what David was going to say, but um, part of what I was going to say will echo some of that. And I want to start with a couple of what I believe are arguably facts. We are, or we have entered an era and an age of disruption in our industry. And as a result, the industry is changing. Some faster than others, some will take longer than others, but we are changing. Tobacco harm reduction has been a stated strategy for many of us for many years. Largely, it was based on a duty of care, legal responsibility. Those days are over. We've moved well beyond that. It's no longer just a duty of care issue. It's an issue of long-term business sustainability, and indeed, for some companies, business survival. There will be winners and losers in this, and I don't just mean the companies that invest in the innovation and the science and, and reallocate resources from their cigarette business to the next generation product business, but I think there are already winners and losers in consumers. 
if you're a consumer in the part of the world where these products are not made available to you, or they're made available but you're not told factual uh, reasons why you should switch to them, then you'll be a loser. If you're a consumer in a part of a world which has a benign regulatory environment and the products can be made available to you and real and meaningful information given to you, then you have a chance to, to change the course of your life and your health. Let's look at some of the drivers of disruption. You know, we are unique with the cigarette category. It's a unique consumer product. It's the only category where the vast majority of consumers want to stop using it, and for good reasons, because they fear their life will end prematurely as a result of using it. And until now, really, they haven't had much choice. We've had fairly ineffective NRT replacements, cold turkey quitting, but not now, because we're in an era of disruptive technology. Some of that technology is coming from outside of the industry, the, the much celebrated Honlick, Coil and Wick. Some of the technology is coming from inside the industry, tobacco heating products being a, a good example of that. And there's more technology to come. It's no secret that our core business is in decline in volume terms. Every year, the duty paid factory made cigarette business declines by around 2 to 3%. And that trend is set to continue. The only categories that are growing currently are illicit cigarettes, which are growing dramatically, and next generation products, mainly vapor and tobacco heating products. And like many consumer categories, it's, we are fragmenting, like beer or uh, snacks or coffee. Consumers aren't prepared to stick with one choice anymore. We used to say that brands were powerful and consumers grateful. This day and age, consumers are powerful and brands are grateful. Consumers want this choice. We are fragmenting. We don't believe that there will be one magic product like a cigarette in the 21st century. That's why we have a dog in every fight, as Clive would say, because consumers will want a range of products. If I could just talk a little bit about how I see our role as a manufacturer, what we bring or what we can bring uh, to this issue of transformation. First, we have deep consumer insights. We engage with the consumers every day. We understand what their needs are, and we can leverage those consumer insights into great innovation. We harness the firepower of our R&D departments, our ecosystem of technology partners all around the world to bring new innovation to life. You know, we have a big juicy for stewardship. Whenever we develop or design products, we're always thinking, how do we not just make these products perform to compete with cigarettes, but how do we make them as safe as possible, whether that's electrical safety or toxicity of the ingredients, and most importantly, the emissions. And you can see out there on the walls the science that's being done to try and characterize the relative risks of these new products. And the scientific challenge is huge. We don't have years of epidemiology like we have in cigarettes or snooze. And finally, and I think this is, this is a big point, what we bring is scale. When you work in 185 countries around the world, and you have huge uh, capabilities to not just develop, but to distribute and market products that bring scales to consumers all around the world, not just in a few cities, but in every country on the planet. I'm no expert in regulation or tobacco control policy. I'm a scientist, a technologist, and an innovator. My plea to those people that establish policy and regulation is fivefold. First of all, help us innovate in our products. Don't hold us back. Promote innovation. The cigarette is an incredibly successful consumer product, but with one fatal flaw. We are competing with the cigarette in the eyes of cigarette smokers to give them an alternative which they will switch to, not just because it's safer, because it's enjoyable too. Set standards on product safety that everybody can be attain who is serious about getting into uh, this category and wants a long-term business, whether they are big companies or small companies. Give us appropriate marketing freedom so that we can communicate these new categories and build brands. We're building brands on new categories which have never been seen before. Without appropriate communication, it's going to be virtually impossible to do that. And I think also importantly, we need our consumers to have appropriate freedoms to use these products. So if tobacco heating products and vapor products, if the consensus is they don't pose a risk to those around them, because scientifically it's been established that they don't present environmental toxicants, 
then let consumers use them indoors. Why should someone have to go outside amongst the cigarette smokers to vape? And finally, we need people to be clear of the risks. You've heard many times that there's great confusion out there, that people think e-cigarettes and let's see one tobacco heating products are as harmful as cigarettes, which is clearly scientifically untrue, if not unlikely. Finally, I just want to say a word on trust. I know I've heard that word a lot. I'm not asking you to trust us. I'm not even asking you to believe what we are saying. I'm asking for you to judge us fairly on the actions we are taking in tobacco harm reduction. My dream is that in the future there's another generation of people sitting in this room saying the leaders in the tobacco industry in the early part of the 21st century got it right, unlike the leaders of the tobacco industry 60 years ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I'll just keep moving along to a fourth speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce Alex Wodnack. Um, Alex has a, a very long career in uh, alcohol and drug harm reduction um, and a proponent of tobacco harm reduction. Alex. Thank you very much. I'm going to pose five questions to all of us. The first question is, what is the essence of this problem? And in my view, it's that we have an unresolved conflict over how to reduce tobacco-related harm realistically. And for me, the way that conflict plays out is that we have, on the one hand, the certainty of harm from smoking versus the less than certainty of much less harm from electronic nicotine dispensing systems. How long has this conflict existed? Well, it began in 1950, I would say, uh, with Richard Doll's um, historical paper, uh, after which he held a press conference together with the then Minister of Health in England, the, um, the late Ian MacLeod. And Ian MacLeod chain-smoked through that, interview, that press conference where Richard Doll explained uh, his findings. Second stage really began in the 1960s on both sides of the Atlantic as Britain and America started to gear up towards getting tobacco under control in some way. I'd guess the third stage started with the FCTC. And stage four, I think, began in 2003 with the creation of this uh, uh, new device that has transformed the whole debate. So it's been a long time coming, and it's really only been in the last 14 years that we've had a possibility of trying to resolve this complicated debate. What's the conflict about? Well, one group of people in tobacco control, public health, want all tobacco use to stop. Uh, and they want to do that in a way that is effective, safe, that is without severe unintended negative consequences, and in a way that is also cost effective. The tobacco industries, we've just heard, want safer products and they want to continue making profits standard in business. Vapors want a range of options that have the look, feel and hit of cigarettes and which are effective, available, attractive and affordable. Most smokers want to quit. Uh, most of those who want to quit find it very hard to do so and many of them will end up quitting on their own but a good number of them will want some help. Tobacco harm reduction wants to minimise the health and economic costs of nicotine use by reducing, as with other groups, by reducing initiation, helping people to quit, and along with vapours, also by wanting to help those who are unable or unwilling to quit to reduce harm. Is this conflict important? Well, it's the major cause of preventable disease worldwide, so it's got to be important. I love the uh, slogan that World Health Organization used to use uh, when they described their mission as adding years to life and adding life to years. Well, doing something effective about tobacco would certainly achieve those aims. 
Let's never forget, a billion smokers in the world, a billion tobacco-related deaths estimated in the next 100 years. Huge economic costs to smokers and the community. And let's also remember the distribution of this problem around the world. It's a declining problem in the developing world, but it's a major and growing problem in the, sorry, it's a major, it's a declining problem in the developed world, but it's a major and growing problem in much of the developing world. Let's also remember how conflicts get resolved. Most conflicts get resolved when the stakeholders eventually start talking to each other, and listening to each other around a table. And that's what we really need, to get the stakeholders at events like this to do more and more talking with each other, to identify areas of common interest and agreement and expand those rather than continuing to bash each other over the head about areas they disagree with and trying to shrink those areas. That's usually not very effective. We need to develop some trust and try and expand that trust. We need to act locally, but think globally. I want to finish by telling you a very brief story about an experience I had not so far from here in Brno in Czechoslovakia, what was then Czechoslovakia is now the Czech Republic. I was traveling with my brother in 1985. We met an architect, um, took us to his home, he was standing on his little balcony looking over a little square and he described his life experience to us. He described how he had been a young person, very young, when his country was occupied for the first time by the Nazis. He was older when his country was occupied a second time by the Soviet Union. And he progressed in his career and he was apparently very brilliant. He was offered a promotion, but the price of the promotion was that he had to join the Communist Party. He refused to join the Communist Party and then he was committing the crime of being unemployed, which was a crime in the communist era. And he told us this whole story without any self-pity. And then he said something I've never forgotten. I think it's relevant to this discussion. He said, but I learned over my life that not all the communists were bad people and not all the anti-communists were good people. And I think it's good to remember that lesson as we try and deal with this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe swiftly on before we get to our discussion time, um, I'd like to introduce our last speaker, who's Julie Vosner, who works for the Consumer Associates for Smoke-Free Alternatives for America. Julie. Yeah, I'm not going to do the gauntlet there. <laughs> Harm reduction. <laughs> well, first off, thank you. Um, we're so grateful to have an opportunity to speak with everybody here. Um, by way of background, um, my name is Julie Westner. I am the National Policy Director and the President of the Board of the Consumer Advocates for Smoke-Free Alternatives Association, which naturally goes by CASA um, because it's a rather big mouthful. And we are a US-based organization with more than 200,000 members. We represent users, um, current users, and those who might in the future choose to use low-risk alternatives to smoking. We are US-based, and I want to offer the caveat that my discussion is about public health and the vapor industry and tobacco industry in the United States. And I know that our experience isn't necessarily universal, um, although to the extent that the U.S. does import some of its awfulness, or actually export, um, my apologies, and I suspect that our experiences in the U.S. are similar to a number of uh, people. Most consumer organizations are formed in responses um, to abuse by industry, whether it's um, predatory corporate practices, unsafe products, false advertising. CASA, however, was formed in response to threats posed by the United States government, namely FDA's decision in 2009 to attempt to ban e-cigarettes as unapproved drugs. Strangely enough, vapors don't view industry as our enemy. To the contrary, we generally consider the diverse vapor industry as a partner of sorts, given that virtually all of the significant improvements, both in terms of performance and safety, have been driven by consumer demand and implemented by an industry that's incredibly responsive to that demand. 
What's not to love? Industry is not seeking to limit our access to these potentially life-saving products or to mislead us about the relative risks of these products. That role in the U.S. has been taken on by our government, hand in hand with public health. In the early years, um, and I've been vaping since 2009, I was an early adopter. I was a two and a half pack a day smoker for more than 30 years, had more quit attempts than I could possibly count. My last one was Shantex, and that was rather disastrous. So when I picked up an e-cigarette in 2009, I wasn't trying to quit, I was just trying to cut back. Um, but within three days, I was a non-smoker, and I was a vapor. And in the early days, back in 2009, um, consumers understood and perhaps even appreciated a bit of healthy skepticism on the part of public health with these newfangled devices that were coming in. But as the evidence continued to mount about the low-risk nature of vapor products, instead of recognizing the promise and embracing it, um, public health doubled down on the bad information the bad science, and the bad policy decisions. And I know this is an uncomfortable discussion <laughs> um, for a lot of people here who feel like you know, public health is really doing the work of the angels. But in the United States, we have a very serious problem. Our experience is that our members have become very suspicious of both public health and regulatory agencies involved in tobacco policy. As consumers become more educated about the dramatic differences in risks associated with, associated with vapor products and smokeless tobacco versus combustible, they become less trusting of those who seek to push paternalistic agendas, laws and regulations ostensibly designed to protect consumers from their own choices. In the United States, public health refuses to give consumers accurate and truthful information about the relative risk of products, effectively preventing consumers from making informed decisions about their lifestyle choices. Moreover, U.S. laws are such, as, as Cynthia described, that businesses are prohibited from sharing truthful information with their customers about the low-risk nature of these products. We are actually astonished that anyone might think that genuine public health interests are served by messaging that treats all tobacco as equally dangerous and that confuses and scares smokers away from trying the low-risk alternatives. It boggles the imagination that public health actively promotes coercive policies that will reduce consumer choice and that they do so without even a thought of involving consumers in the policy-making process. Not only does public health exclude the consumer voice from the process, our needs and desires are not even considered. The fact that we might find low-risk nicotine use enjoyable, immaterial. The pleasure principle seems largely lost on these folks. They don't even seem to understand that adults like flavors. That too is irrelevant. Whoops, sorry. This is what happens with you technology. Hold on. There's something terribly wrong when public health refuses to constructively engage or consider the public that they claim to serve. Now make no mistake, consumers have a very healthy skepticism of the large tobacco companies. We fully realize that they thrive in a heavily regulated environment and that they're driven by a need to provide value to their shareholders. But even so, we're intelligent enough to realize that the tobacco companies have much to gain by providing low-risk alternatives to their customers. We know that, well, and here's, here's a really sad thing. So the big discussion, of course, is about research. You know, should we trust research coming from industry, whether it's, you know, the tobacco companies, the vapor industry, or industry-funded research? And I would say to you that from the informed consumer standpoint, we trust that research more than much of what's coming out of public health. And the reason why, it's, it's a few reasons. Number one, much of the stuff coming from public health is just demonstrably bad. I mean, it's really bad. Um, but more so than that, we know that everything that industry puts out is going to be scrutinized under a microscope. If there's a problem, somebody's gonna find it. Consumers have gradually come to understand that public health has its own agenda when it comes to tobacco control, one that is based on ideology, politics, money, power, influence, and control, and it has very little to do with actual genuine public health. This is a world where the ends justify the means. 
A few years back, I had the opportunity to talk with a gentleman who had been in a leadership position with one of the major public health nonprofits in the U.S. I pointed out to him that much of the misinformation about smokeless tobacco could be laid at the feet of that nonprofit. His response was something along the lines of, you have to understand, we were worried that smokeless might be a gateway to smoking. When I think of all the smokers who, have made, who could have made the switch to smokeless years ago, had they understood the low risk nature of those products, I feel physically ill. And the lies continue today. In the US, one of the required warnings that rotate on smokeless tobacco, warning, this product is not a safe alternative to cigarettes. For the average consumer, what do you think that means? It doesn't mean like, oh yeah, these are incredibly low risk. It means these are pretty much as bad as smoking. I might as well continue to smoke. From the consumer standpoint, the problem isn't the industry. The problem is tobacco control. And unless tobacco control and public health comes to the table and starts dealing with reality, this mistake is going to be measured not only in dollars, but in lives. Thank you. Too. Thank you very much, panel. Um, a range of different interesting insights and observations there. Um, can we raise the lights in the hall a wee bit, actually, because we're going to have to engage the audience uh, in this next step. I have to say thank you very much indeed, folks, for your patience. Um, I, I know that we've been on for maybe about 30 minutes or so, or just over there. Apparently, just before we do that, apparently the average attention span of, of your average adult is between 11 and 13 minutes. I understand, I don't, I've not read the research, but I understand that's what the research say, suggests. Um, and then an audience splits into two sort of themes, you know, half of an audience starts to think about logistical things like, uh, did I leave the iron on there or did I, I need to go and make my dinner or I'm really hungry or I think there's food out there later so let's go and do that. And guess what the other half of the audience apparently think about? Sex, apparently. So <laughs> apparently the other half of the audience think about sex. So when you're ever doing a talk to people and you're getting to 11 and 13 minutes, look around the audience and start thinking, well, I wonder what they're thinking about, actually. So, <laughs> Right, let's get a bit of a discussion going. We've got a couple of roving mics. I think we'll have to use this one here, guys. Do you want to get that? Um, and I wonder if we could use another one of these, if that's okay, and we can share one. Thank you. Okay, a range of different... Um, really different insights there. Now, is there anybody that's want to kick off with a burning question that, that you might have? Just over here, in the middle there, the gentleman. Uh, thank you very much, Clive Bates. Um, I want to put a, a question initially to uh, David O'Reilly, and it's a two-parter. Are there... Are there tensions within a company uh, like BAT uh, about this sort of the direction of travel you're taking? Are, are there sort of rival visions of the future that are sort of battling it out around the broad boardroom table? Are there staff that are not convinced and in resistance mode? That's the first part of the question. And the second part is, what are the sort of main external barriers that you see, if, you, if you're conceptualizing this as a, a transition from one sort of core product to a set of next generation core products, what are the main barriers that are slowing that down and getting in the, in the way of that? Okay, uh, thanks Clive. I mean, I can only talk about our boardroom um, and where we are now. I think in the past, yes, there was uh, dissonance and disagreement about what the future look like. I think uh, it's very clear now that that, that future uh, is a world with little or no combustible products. The, we can debate when that's going to happen. The tension, I think, is uh, it's not just a dissonance that the vast majority of our business continues to be cigarettes and will for a while. Um, I think it's, it's the... The skill in all of this, I think, is going to be how you mobilize and reallocate resources from a category which is de declining into a new category. And will you run through a period where, you know, you're not keeping the shareholders as happy as, as you want to. And, and that's, that, you know, that's why the board is paid what it's paid to manage that. And that's what shareholders expect us to do. So that's where our debate is right now. Mobilizing it, but doing it in a way that it's a, a smooth transition 
uh, from where we are today to where we think the, the future will be. Uh, and, and that comes with a lot of pressure. You know, the CEO comes into my office every day and he, do, he doesn't give me a hard time about uh, growing share in the cigarette business. He wants to know about the innovation pipeline in next generation products. And uh, rarely is he satisfied with uh, the pace. So, um, you know, we're doing what we can. The, the barriers, I, you know, if, if I worry about things outside of our control, then I think, as I said, it is in the... I think these categories could be killed very easily. They're very fragile. Tobacco heating products, vapor products, hybrid products, and, and other things that we're conceiving are incredibly fragile. And if somebody... And I'm not going to perhaps say how you would kill it precisely, but you could kill, for instance, um, any of these categories with an excise treatment that just destroys uh, profitability. It would just, it, I mean, it's not even just making them less profitable, it could be actually making them just you, profit, uh, uh, you know, loss making. So I think excise treatment for me is, is something that's, that's fundamentally important. But all of the other things I said, you know, as, as many of you know, we're about to uh, hopefully acquire Reynolds American uh, in the US. So I'm about to get the pleasure of operating innovation under the FDA regime. And it's, guys, it's really depressing. And I feel sorry for American, you know, we try to put consumers at the heart of this. And I'm, I'm thinking about, it's not often I feel sympathetic for Americans, but, <laughs> you know, I, I really feel sorry for the American consumer now. Because they're going to be getting products years later than, than consumers in Europe or Africa or Japan or other countries. If at all, we can get those products into the marketplace, you know, in the first place. So it, it, it's crazy. But, you know, we'll try. Just a, a very brief, you know, follow-up. If the motivations balance between commercial motivations or corporate social responsibility sort of motivations, where would you, where do you strike that balance? Well, it's I think largely. Look, I'll be totally frank here. This is commercial. The, the main drivers here are are commercial. This it, the the companies that, you know, when I joined the board and I used to uh, listen to the commercial discussions, I felt like a World War One general watching trench warfare. We gain 0.1% share here, lose 0.1% share here. And it's been like that for decades and decades. This is now something very different. The companies that really engage and embrace this will, will take massive leaps into the future. And those that don't will, will struggle, I'm afraid. So it just so happens that it's also the right thing to do. So the alignment of our commercial objectives with doing the right thing surely is a powerful combination, I would argue. Good. Thank you for that. Uh, another question? There must be. There was so much content in those deliveries there. The, the lady in the third row at the back there? Uh, I, I have it. I have it here. Excuse me. Um, I can't really see, so I apologise for coming down. I'm standing. Right, sorry, yeah, I got no you. No problem. Uh, Mario from ESIC Intelligence. I would like to ask Cynthia what is she focuses on uh, currently. Is that a tax or public place usage or PMTA? Um, that's it, thank you. Sadly, there's no shortage of things to focus on. Uh, but my work right now is more on the regulatory and the legislative approaches that are being taken to trying to save the vaping industry in the United States. The, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. by the way, there is work going on. I mean, there is some state level, there, taxation is not an issue at the federal level. But at the state level, there are taxation issues, and so we do get involved in some of those. Um, but overall, it's more of the federal issues than the state ones. Is there anyone else from the panel who would like to pick up on that subject or that theme at all? No? No? Okay, we'll move, we'll move the theme on a bit. Um, there was a lady here, I think. Ah, there we go. Could we bring the mic down here? Thank you, yes. Hi, I'm uh, Cecilia from Swedish Match. Uh, I think this is a fascinating discussion because I, I, I get the sense where we are today in the political discussion that we haven't yet connected fully with public health. We have, we're speaking to pockets of public health and they understand what we're saying. But I would like to ask the entire panel how you think that we should engage with public health in a constructive way. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about public health and tobacco control, which I see as two parts of, of that group. Thank you. 
So, panel, if we're partners, how do we step up to the plate and work as partners? David. Uh, sure. I, one area where I would disagree with some of the comments that have been made is uh, there's the comments about public health, like it's like everybody who's uh, involved in saying anything on this topic from an anti-smoking or anti-tobacco side is public health. They're not. Uh, it's like calling creationists evolutionary biologists. They're not. Um, I mean, there's objective criteria necessary for public health. If somebody told you the only way to prevent AIDS is to never have sex outside of marriage, for heaven's sakes, gay males should, should get reprogrammed. That's not public health. I mean, people did that. That wasn't public health. Uh, I think what we've had is, and I've, I've seen it during the, uh, my career, I mean, early on, you know, in Canada, we got a law passed in the 1980s, I, I, I wrote part of it, that did have a public health provision. It, it gave a relative advantage to less hazardous products that would be marketed to replace cigarettes. Um, the, the law was, was eventually thrown out by cigarette companies in a constitutional challenge. That wasn't a problem in the anti-smoking community. Nobody objected to that. But then what we had is a lot more people getting involved who started seeing this as a good guy versus bad guy issue. Uh, they were dragon slayers. Uh, and they called themselves public health, and they, they weren't. And I think, uh, Sweden, you're a really good example of this, because if you look for a good public health example, you've got a company that made a decision based on the research that was available decades ago. We've got to get people off combustion. And they did it. They, they, they moved toward non-combustion products. They managed to get relative advantages uh, from a tax standpoint, picking up what David O'Reilly was saying. So it was cheaper to buy the less hazardous product. They marketed those products. They gave them an advantage. And we see that country has now got daily smoking down to 5%. I mean, that was a huge public health breakthrough. A lot of people in Sweden who call themselves public health oppose that every single step of the way. Uh, so I think we have to be careful what we call public health. Uh, and if you're looking at who to engage with, deal with the people who are pragmatic. The pure food movement opposed any sort of food manufacturing. They, they were moralistic. The anti-saloon league was opposed to any form of alcohol. Those groups weren't public health. They might have called themselves that, they weren't. There's an objective criteria. So I'd say deal with the people who truly are public health, and if you're public health, you accept risk reduction as one of the four pillars of what you can do to reduce death, injury, and disease. Julie, you spoke yourself a lot about the interface with public health. Um, how can you build more collaborative and trusting relationships? First off, um, I think David's comments are, are fair. Um, it's probably not good for me to paint all of public health in the U.S. with, with a, a broad brush, which is what happens um, with painting tobacco companies and vapor companies, yeah. the same thing. But, you know, our experience is that we've got public charities, um, we've got government-funded organizations, and they are just not wanting to do this. And, and our perception, and I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but this seems to be a war, like David said, the good guys against the bad guys. And I think there might have been a feeling from some people that the tobacco companies were on the ropes. We were going to get our tobacco-free world. This is great. By the way, w you know, consumers, we don't, we're not going for a tobacco-free world. Um, but I think that with the introduction of vapor and the entry of the tobacco companies into the vapor space, that really started to get people to pause and think that, you know, once again, we're giving a new lease on life to the tobacco companies. So I think the war is largely misplaced. We've just had very little luck engaging. So I have nothing to offer. If somebody has any good advice for us, let me know. I was going to say to the panel, bear this thought in your mind because I'm going to ask you just to sum up at the end in your thoughts but one of the things I'd like to ask you is to think about how do you progress from where we are today then? Will you want to add something Cynthia? Yeah, I wanted to respond to David, this David uh, comment about public health and dealing with people who are more pragmatic. The problem in the US is that the pragmatic folks are few and far between and have yet to be able to sway the pendulum enough to make a difference with regards to the survival of the industry and consumer choice. So, I mean, in my opinion, the fact that there isn't a full-on endorsement by 
the near, you know, we have the antis, we have the ones who are just, this is a tobacco product and it's a horrible product and, you know, it's, it's another front by big tobacco to hook another generation, whatever. We have those people. And then we have the people who are interested in public health, are harm reduction advocates of sorts, but will not come out and fully embrace the products, right? And so these are the two things that we're left with. The pragmatists are far and few between. So I think that as an industry, we need to expand our tent. We need to start recruiting people. We need to start working on getting the message out there and stop trying to convince people who've been conditional in their support to support us fully. I think we need to work harder at that. One last comment on the dogfight issue, Alex. I'm a little uncomfortable about the uh, criticism of public health. It's, public health certainly isn't perfect, what, what is. Public health certainly makes mistakes. Who doesn't? I'm reminded of um, a comment by, uh, often quoted comment by uh, Abba Eban, the former foreign minister in Israel, who said, the United States always does the right thing after it's tried all the other options. <laughs> and I think public health is much the same. And uh, it's a learning process, and public health makes mistakes. Yep. Tobacco industries make mistakes. If we uh, are mindful of the need to um, try and f not focus on the mistakes the tobacco industry's made, we've got to be mindful of not focusing on the mistakes public health has made. Let's try and focus on where we want to get to. And where we want to get to is to have make it as easy as possible for people to switch from combustible cigarettes to safer alternatives. That's a good, good way to conclude that. Life's better understood backwards. It's just a pity you've got to live it forwards. That's the, that's the issue. Um, another question. There was someone up the back, I think, put their hand up earlier on. This lady there, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Patricia Kovacevic, Nico Pure Labs. Um, question about Australia, very concrete question. Um, so uh, in your opinion, uh, what are the steps that the Australian government will take in the near future to uh, decriminalize vaping and to um, support you know, the trade in a obviously less harmful alternative? And, and from your point of view, what are some of the things you plan, you yourself plan to do concretely in support of that initiative? Uh, pity you didn't hear a wonderful talk by Colin Mendelson outlined uh, a plan in uh, the previous session about what we're trying to do in Australia. Australia uh, usually does well with health. Uh, uh, we spend average amount of uh, the national income on health and get very good outcomes. Um, and uh, this, this is an area where we are very behind and we're particularly behind all the countries that we usually compare ourselves with, United States, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Canada. And, uh, uh, and as Colin summarized in the previous session, uh, we're in a very difficult situation where we've got all the major players in health, all the major health organizations, the health departments, the the doctors' organisations, the uh, Public Health Association, the Cancer Council, and so on, all of them are intransigent and uh, locked into a, uh, a vicious uh, opposition to e-cigarettes. Um, so we don't think we can change that suddenly, but we're, um, a group of us now are mobilising, but we're starting from a, well behind many other countries, many other developed countries, uh, and it's going to take some time, and uh, we, uh, we just have to take it step by step. So at the moment we've uh, written to a number of parliamentarians, we've got an inquiry uh, that's underway, uh, and uh, I don't think that's going to change things overnight, but um, I think we'll get there in the end. But. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult when you're so far behind, but that's where we are. That's a long road. Yeah, a question from this side of the room. Gentleman there with the glasses. Neil Benowitz, University of California, San Francisco. Um, the, the first research that I published in a major journal actually dealt with harm reduction questions. This was back in the 1980s when we looked at... Um, cotinine levels in 
people smoking cigarettes with different yields. And at that time, there was an, an idea that light cigarettes were a harm reduction mm -hmm. approach. And we found, which many people have confirmed since then, that in fact there was no difference in exposure to any toxicants or risk uh, with light cigarettes. And so I think that, that, that raised the first concerns about um, trusting the industry with harm reduction. Now, th 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 uh, let me just put it in perspective. I'm cautiously optimistic about e-cigarettes um, for harm reduction. I personally don't believe that e-cigarettes will be able to out-compete re uh, regular conventional cigarettes. And so the other uh, obvious approach, which, um, w which I think has not been talked about, is um, phasing out conventional cigarettes and supporting alternative nicotine sources um, with industry's support in getting rid of regular cigarettes. Either that or making cigarettes non-addictive, but uniformly. So I would just raise, wouldn't that be the best approach to harm reduction to combine getting rid of, of, of cigarettes? Um, tobacco companies could voluntarily do that at the same time of making good alternative nicotine products. To me, that would be great. And that would be the ideal approach. I think I may have to direct that question towards yourself, David. Is there a long-term game that we can change the tactics and strategies just now? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a massively complicated conundrum. Obviously, we've debated various scenarios. Um, I think, you know, that there is the potential that that could work if you could control everything in the marketplace. And by that, I mean either the absence of any illicit other combustible products, uh, or people modifying their own products with, uh, with, with nicotine. I mean, you know, we come from a consumer-centric commercial organization. We would rather uh, deploy the power of innovation to pull consumers out of combustibles into these new categories. And, and by the way, Neil, I, you, obviously I have the privilege of seeing what's in our pipeline. So my view is I think um, Vapor products have a long way to go, but I think the, the potential is huge. So I, I don't want to promote our own technology so much, but next year we will move away from the coil and wick and our leading platforms, which will take vapor performance to a completely different level. I think tobacco heating products um, like ICOS and Glow will improve as well. Uh, and there'll be other innovations. So, you know, I, I would encourage people not to judge the potential of the current, of the future vapor category based on what you're seeing today. You know, the Coil and Wick was fantastic. I think Hon Lick should get a uh, Nobel Prize for, for what he did. And all the, of the vaping companies that, that embraced that technology way before we did um, should be... But now it's time to move it on a level. So I, I, I would ask people to wait and see just how good these products can get. Because, you know, you've got some of the biggest companies in the world competing vigorously to win this race. And when you have that sort of motivation, I think you will see some real leaps in uh, product performance. And I think cigarettes will disappear naturally. Before I come to that gentleman there, is there any consumer in the audience that, that would want to pick up on that point? You know, should, should we strategically, from a public health and a commercial perspective, phase, phase out tobacco? Gentleman at the back there. Hi, it's Dave Dawn, ex of VTTV, which is now dead. I'd, I'd like to pick up on what Neil said. Um, one of the things I've fought for the last eight and a half years since I took up vaping is the coercion on behalf of tobacco control who tries in vain to get people to do what they don't want to do. And what I found with e-cigs is that they get people to do what they didn't know they wanted to do, but they do do it. It's called the pleasure principle. And people need to learn about this. We've got here a category of product that smokers, and I used to smoke, I'll put it in American terms, three to four packs a day. That's 60 to 80 for anybody that does Diane Abbott maths. <laughs> um, I used to smoke up to 80 cigarettes a day. That was after I'd cut down from 100 a day. And my transition from smoking to vaping was completely totally and utterly accidental. Anybody that's followed me for any length of time knows the story. Lad came in, 
I saw it, said you can't smoke it in here. He tapped it, said it wasn't a real fag. I tried it, asked him where could I get one, bought one, and fortnight later, that was it. I didn't smoke anymore. A committed and militant smoker, by the way, who is now a very committed and some would say militant vapor. People in the UK, and I'll only speak about the UK, there are now 2.9 million vapors in the UK and smoking prevalence has now dropped to what is it 7.2 million somebody nod or shake it's down from the 11 million there was eight years ago that I remember and nobody's been coerced nobody's had their arm twisted up the back and if we have better products to come as David's been saying then people are going to make that choice of their own volition as the future comes along. But it is going to need the help from every professional that's in this room to choose a form of words that actually helps people make that choice. Because at the moment, when you come to conferences like this and when you read research papers, you see heavy metals, titanium, cadmium, God knows what -ium, Lord knows of other things <laughs> that the people on mum's net will say to their friends, don't use them, they've got heavy metals in them, they'll kill you, your child will be deformed, it'll have 14 legs, three toes, and it'll be, it'll be, you know, you, this is what happens on mum's net. Because we're not talking about people at a degreed level on there. What we need from you, the professionals, is the following form of words. E-cigarettes are safe enough. The risk profile on them is much less than following David Sweeney on his bike through the centre of London. <laughs> There's a consensus on that. <laughs> E-cigarettes are safer than riding a Harley Davidson at 95 miles an hour down the M1 being chased by a bobby in a Fiat Panda that won't go as fast as a Harley. <laughs> E-cigarettes are safer than walking into a pub in Glasgow that's got green and white painted all over the front. Oh, steady, going, steady. Rangers, yes. <laughs> Come on, I knew you were going there. Well, you... <laughs> There you go. I mean, the bottom line on it is the risk profile on these things is so low. Everybody keeps saying this. It's so low. Say it to the people out there. Tell them the risk profile. Don't bother comparing it to cigarettes because nobody really knows how risky cigarettes are because everybody's got the 95-year-old granddad that's been smoking all his life. Bring it round to what people know. Less risky than following Sweener on his bike. <laughs> Less risky than running after me on my bike. Less risky than running down the stairs, especially when there's no wet floor signs up. That's what we need from you lot. That's what we need from the professionals. We don't need coercion. We don't need cigarettes banning because cigarettes will disappear up their own backsides of their own volition when the professionals that are talking to ordinary people out there tell them the truth. E-cigs are safe enough. A strong and passionate message given there, I think. <laughs> uh, I had to draw it to a wee bit of a conclusion there because it would have been more risky if you went on for the stampede to get to the alcohol that's sitting outside there. If it, <laughs> there was one little, There was a question over there. Let, how long do we have, guys? Another five minutes or so? Are you okay, folks, for another five or ten minutes? Okay. The gentleman who has got the microphone now. I'm not going to try and follow that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Branco, uh, Vaping Advocate, uh, Vapor Stand United. It's just a simple question. Um, now we're, we're in the mindset of tobacco harm reduction, how does the whole panel feel about vaping in a role of um, harm prevention? where this tackles the the neat the market well not the market the where the the smoking prevalence starts in teenagers okay and how are they expected to wait to a legal age mm -hmm. to be able to evade so where does the responsibility lie within that context dave sure uh th this is the sort of question that is, is very easy to answer being pragmatic um, it's, uh, it's one that gets you in a whole lot of trouble if, say, somebody's filming you while you uh, answer it. So, so just between us, um, 
<laughs> it's not a problem. That what we're talking about is, is risk reduction. The, the sorts of young people who might be attracted to doing this are the sort who would otherwise be smoking. Um, but personally, I'm not even all that concerned about the young people, because there's far fewer of them now, who take up smoking, because we know if you've got viable alternatives, they can get off smoking. I mean, the problem we've had is that people get onto something, by the time they make up their mind, I'd rather not do this, they don't have any choice. Uh, I think giving people realistic options, giving them truthful information, uh, works really well in public health. And I would do the same, and, and I would not get in the way of somebody who's, say, 16 and says, I'd rather do this than smoke my cigarettes. Uh, and I'm not particularly concerned about people doing real low-risk things. Um, I don't stand in the way of a 17-year-old walking into a Starbucks. Um, pe people do things. Uh, we need to focus on that billion deaths total and, and do something really significant and stop worrying about tiny little things that get in the way that might prevent us from focusing on the big picture. David, did you want to add anything at all? No, we'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I okay. totally agree. Yeah, seems a consensus there. Right, I, I'm going to have to watch our time a bit here. There's a competition for questions. So can you ask your question briefly, and I'll take all three, I think there are three, just to see if the themes are the same, and then we'll address that from there. Is that okay? You guys, could you think about how you might sum up, if I was offering you 30 seconds, just to conclude with, with what your wishes would be for how we move on from what you think the situation is at the moment? Is it stronger collaboration? Is it a building a better relationship with public? Is it all of those sorts of things? So just bear your mind to that for a moment. The gentleman over here in the purple shirt. I hope it's purple. Lilac. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Joe, a, uh, a, how can I say, a disparaged consumer in the US. And as you say, I, uh, I correctly say, David, um, I am sorry, sorrowful. Uh, how would you um, comment on the public or on the perception within the vaping community that big tobacco have driven the negative perceptions of vaping and blackballed the, the whole, um, I guess, industry? in addition to influencing, regulating, policy, lobbying, all those good things. David, was that directed to David O'Reilly, yeah? Uh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to comment on a US-specific uh, issue if that's what it is. You know, I'm, I'm pretty naive on that. Well, it, vapors but, say it's global. I don't yeah, know. I, I, um, I'd like to think that us entering the category has, yeah, it's, it's created controversy, of course it has. Um, but our aim is to build, is to bring standards and a order to it and scale to reach uh, more consumers. I can't say I'm happy with every e-cigarette that I see out there on the market. You know, when, when, I, when we do our stewardship tests, there are some that I see that I'm, I'm not entirely uh, happy with that. In terms of lobbying and all the rest of it, I think you're overestimating the power of our companies. You know, I, don't, I just don't think we, even if we tried it, we don't have the firepower to achieve all the things that we're, or a fraction of the things we're accused of, of doing. I think you need to look on the other side of the fence. I didn't follow my own guidance there. Yeah, it's on you go then. Just to follow up, I would say, if, if I had to respond to someone in the vapor industry with that concern, I would point out to them that the FDA has done a far better job of strengthening tobacco companies' positions than tobacco companies have. They've essentially handed them the market if things continue the way they, they will. So with tobacco companies having to do nothing. I'm really sorry, folks. I'm going to have to think. Would, there was two, a couple of people. Are you desperate for your question up the back there? Desperate. desperate. Absolutely. On you go then. I think another way to reframe the old discussion is to stop talking about harm and harm reduction and start instead uh, talking more about the benefits. And I think uh, this is a good way to win the heart and the brain of a lot of advocates and scientists all over the world. Yeah, that sounds like a good plea. Thank you very much for that. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I know there are another couple of questions, but the organizers here are giving me the sign earlier on when I said I could talk for Scotland. They're sort of getting really anxious and ready to pull the plug, so they'll be shouting about the calendar shortly. Um, just to sum up, guys, you've got 30 seconds, a couple of sentences. How do we move on from here? David. 
I, I think that a really important part of being a pragmatic revolutionary, is, because that's what we need, is to recognize that good policy is contagious. Sure, the United States is messed up. As a Canadian, I've known that for a very long time. Um, <laughs> but if you get good policies through in other countries, and you get them talked about, talk about what's happening in the UK, see how many fewer people are smoking. Publicity about Japan. I mean, that's amazing when you look at Sandai, like a quarter of the cigarette market, gone. Uh, and, 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 and still changing rapidly. Sweden, I mean, you know, talk these things up to, to create the awareness that there is a solution out there because other places will start to pick up on that. Not all at once, but it starts moving from country to country. And I've lived that experience with laws we passed in Canada over the decades and seeing them picked up elsewhere, it happens. That was more than 30 seconds and more than two sentences, I have to I'm say. Part <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia. 30 seconds. I would say that the vapor industry is willing to engage. They always have been. They're willing to engage with FD FDA. They're willing to engage with public policy folks, public, traditional public health, and with tobacco companies and the consumers. The vapor industry is willing. We're just looking for the opportunity where we can make that happen to an effective end. Thank you. Well, I'm just glad to still be alive at the end of this panel session. So. <laughs> um, look, seriously, we should do more of this, right? I mean, the more we talk to each other, the more we understand each other's perspective on this issue, I think it can only help and then amplify that uh, outside. I did, I did make a comment to, uh, to Paddy and, and Jerry before coming here that given this is the Global Forum on Nicotine, we don't seem to be talking about nicotine very much itself. And I think to Ricardo's uh, question, that's something that in the future, I personally would like to talk more about, rather than, it wants, you know, the harm reduction, of course, is really important, but we have to understand it is, you know, what it is about nicotine. And, and in the future, maybe some of the benefits which could help accelerate the migration out of combustible products into cleaner forms of nicotine consumption. Thank you. I think what we all need to do much more is focus on the objectives. We are fuzzy about the objectives, some of us. Uh, let's be clear about that. Let's try and get consensus about that. I think some of us who should really be our allies in this struggle, uh, their objective really is to get even with the tobacco industry. And it's to get even with the tobacco industry, which, let's be fair, has behaved reprehensibly or even beyond reprehensibly in the past. Uh, we've got to forget that. We've got to identify uh, the real goal, and the real goal is to um, uh, reduce harms and, as Ricardo reminded us, uh, maximise benefits. I wanted to also just um, find a quote. I couldn't. I was looking for it, couldn't find it, by Austin Bradford Hill, who worked closely with Richard Dole, and has got a wonderful quote. He said it a few times in different ways about um, the fact that Evidence is never perfect. It's always going to be better next week, next month, next year. And you've got to go with policy based on the best evidence that you've got now. And we've got enough evidence now. And uh, we ought to use that evidence. And uh, let's move as fast as we can so that smokers have a choice for less harmful alternatives. Thank you. Quit trying to spend so much time trying to control consumers and consumer behaviors and instead focus on providing us with more choices, more options, truthful and accurate information. I promise you that if we have good choices, if we have good information, the vast majority of us will make wise decisions. Thank you very much, panel. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'd uh, be very grateful if you just show your appreciation collectively for all our panel. I think they've done a lot of good job.